I would like to thank uh, Brandon Staglin and the, the, the Staglin family and the organizers for the opportunity uh, to talk to you today. And it may seem uh, um, strange that here's a brain injury talk in, in this mix, but frankly, the, the issues with psychiatric health are far more similar than they are dissimilar to the world of, of brain injury. And some of the things that I'm not gonna talk about, but we are learning that, uh, that some of the downstream consequences of dementia following traumatic brain injury may in fact be an autoimmune problem, as an example, or some of the things that I'm gonna show you today that speak to the last question, that it is aberrant connections in the brain that may actually be responsible for the manifestation of the cognitive consequences that we see after a brain injury. These fields have far more in common than they have uh, uh, dissimilarities. So, Track TBI is the, the largest scale uh, prospective observational study in brain injury that's happening in North America right now. And uh, it is my honor to be here uh, representing the broad group of people that really make this up. And, and why is this important? It's important because every hour in the United States of America, six people die of a traumatic brain injury. 31 people are hospitalized, 194 people go to the emergency room and 457 concussions happen every single hour in the United States. And some of the stuff that I won't show that we've learned from track TBI goes back to this overlap with psychiatric health that if you have a pre-existing major depressive disorder, if you have a pre-existing psychiatric disorder, the consequences of a concussion are far more severe for that group of people. And then we also know there's a whole other cohort of people who develop psychiatric disorders de novo after their brain injury, which ends up being a major contributor to their long-term morbidity and disability. And we all know that this has been a big problem for our military and our recent overseas military conflicts, but trauma is now responsible for more deaths under the age of 45 than any other diagnosis. And one of our fundamental problems is that we do not have a single FDA-approved treatment for traumatic brain injury. And we have done 33 phase three clinical trials and we have had zero, zero successes. And we really, really need to get to the point that what we are doing for patients with traumatic brain injury is making sure that we are maximizing specifically what is best for them. That no two brain injuries are alike and we need to be able to personalize this to understand precisely what's wrong with the patient in front of us and make sure that our treatments are directed towards that. But none of our current diagnostic and classification systems actually do that. None of them tell us what's wrong with the patient, how they're going to do, or what treatment they should receive. So we need a paradigm shift. The way we classify brain injury right now in 2016 is with this thing called the Glasgow Coma Scale Score, and it's broken down into mild, moderate, and severe, and sometimes we use the word concussion interchangeably with the, world, with the word mild. But I don't know what's mild about someone who has a bicycle accident, or my Uber driver this morning, whose husband was a San Francisco cop and was assaulted while covering a parade a few years ago and has never been the same, and she was telling me all of the consequences that have happened for him. He would be considered a mild TBI, but he has never returned to work since this happened to him. I don't know what's mild about that. And we have the same problem on the back end of the words that we use to classify what happens to people down the road. Now, could you imagine where cancer would be if we categorize cancer as mild, moderate, and severe? It's obviously inherently ridiculous. Cancer has gotten to where it's been, just as Steve was talking about earlier, by being exceptionally precise about what is that cancer in front, of, in, in front of the physician taking care of that patient. And we can genotype leukemias into very, very specific forms of leukemia that will tell you that this person should have this chemotherapy and that person should have something completely different, and that is where the success has come. And we need to get to that same degree of success for brain disorders, whether it's psychiatric disease or whether it's traumatic brain injury or whether it's something else. So in walks track TBI, which is a study meant specifically to get right at that very point. And I'm gonna show you two victories that we've gotten out of this study that really position us to take substantial steps forward on the diagnosis side 
um, to create this pathway for precision medicine and to open the door to the identification of effective treatments. It's a precision medicine approach. It is absolutely inherent upon uh, or dependent upon the philanthropic support that we've received. One Mind is really at the forefront of that. They were the early adopter, if you will, from our uh, private partners in helping to make this study a success. It started with an NIH award. The Department of Defense has recognized the value of what we're doing and has also brought resources to the table. It's 11 sites across the US, and we're going after clinical imaging, biomarker, and outcome data. It is a genuine public-private partnership all of the entities on this screen have some um, significant contribution to the success, and really without all of these things, it can't be done. It is team science. It is uh, the capacity for all the people on this screen and all of the, the degrees of separation that go past the people on this screen to put aside egos, to focus on what is right for the field and that it's not about any of us individually, it is really about the field of traumatic brain injury. We are grateful for the impact that our, our private partners have had on this in this public-private partnership. I'm gonna talk about one in particular later, Abbott, uh, but one mine, like I said, was the early adopter, and we're very grateful to General Corelli and, and, uh, and that entire team, Mona Hicks is here as well, for their ability to help us be successful. These are the 11 sites across the country that are enrolling subjects into the, into the study. There are nine additional sites for data analysis. We're gonna collect data from 3,000 patients, including controls. We're not using the terms mild, moderate, and severe. We're focusing on people who are coming to the emergency room and told you're fine, go home. And we've already learned that that's not true, that over 60% of them are still having serious issues six months later the people who are admitted to the hospital, and then the people who admitted to the ICU, many of whom are in coma. And we need to understand something about every one of these panels if we're ever going to get to be uh, where we want to be. And we have to do this with data collaboration. So we've set it up that QuestGen is the data collection interface. FitBear is, uh, is a, uh, an effort of the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Defense, and other federal agencies for the place to store the data. OneMind has brought TransMart into the mix, and what TransMart does is it allows us to curate and analyze the data. If we have mountains and mountains of data, for data's sake, it's not helpful. You have to convert data into knowledge, and that's far trickier than it sounds. Um, and that's what TransMart is helping us do. And we have to have all these people play nicely in the sandbox. <laughs> and it's working somehow. And Jeff Manley's here, and, and, and a lot of credit goes to Jeff Manley for herding the cats and for getting people to put aside their egos and, and focus on the goals at hand. So now I'm going to tell you about two early victories that we're having. And one of them is in uh, the space of brain imaging. And 95% of patients who sustain a traumatic brain injury have normal imaging on the basis of what is clinically available in 2016, okay? But could you imagine an orthopedic trauma surgeon trying to take care of a patient with broken bones if he didn't have an x-ray? We have to be able to image the brain in a way that tells us precisely where the problem is if we are going to get to this point of precision medicine and that picture on the right is as good as it gets in 2016, these fuzzy, grainy pictures trying to show us these connections that you were hearing about earlier, these, these uh, white matter pathways that take uh, information from one part of the brain to the other and underlie all of our cognitive and neurologic functions. Well, that's as good as it gets in 2016, but we're getting much, much better than that. And the first thing that we found in the track TBI study was that 27% of people who have a normal CAT scan have an abnormal MRI. So that's a big, that's a big change in and of itself. And, we, and then when we look carefully, we could see that certain patterns of injury on the MRI were very strongly predictive of people who were still having a problem three months later. But we gotta get better. And in steps this technology, high definition fiber tracking, which is the brainchild of people who are vastly smarter than I am, one of whom is, is Walt Schneider, who's, on, uh, who's, who's pictured on the screen there. This is really next, next generation white matter imaging. At present, you can only get this kind of scan if you're participating in one of our studies. 
but we are somewhere between three and four years away from this being FDA approved for broad clinical use. And the only way we're gonna get there is through the large scale effort of track TBI. So the Department of Defense has paid for the introduction of the high definition fiber tracking or HDFT into the study. And what HDFT does, HDFT does is it allows us to basically do a virtual dissection of the brain. And we can separate these white matter pathways, these cables, if you will, into their component parts that underlie motor function, that underlie language. But this is a good example of we can map how information goes from the eye and the retina through the optic nerve, through the various uh, um, uh, components, all the way back to the visual cortex. And what we've done is we've worked out how you can quantify all of those connections in a way that then pinpoints where change has occurred. And that has been a whole host of math that has been, um, had to be invented, frankly. We've had statisticians and mathematicians from Carnegie Mellon helping with this effort. Um, but we've gotten to the point that we can now pinpoint and quantify precisely where we're seeing changes in white matter and we're correlating those with changes in cognitive and neurologic function. And the two basic ways that we analyze this is, first of all, that we're highly, highly symmetric entities. Our left and right sides are very, very similar. And if someone has their fingers chopped off, it is very easy to tell the difference between left and right. And that is true for the vast majority of, of the brain as well. Left and right are symmetric and trauma breaks symmetry. So we've worked out ways to do this quantitative analysis in a healthy volunteer, the correlation between left and right is virtually one, but in at following trauma, which will happen in a random fashion, right? It doesn't happen to the same place every single time. So we have to analyze every single one of these pathways to find the needle in the haystack. But then we can identify where there is a difference between left and right, and then when we identify that difference, can we correlate it with a practical or clinical outcome um, change for the patient? And the second way that we analyze this, um, the analogy is what happened to the trees in Central Park after Hurricane Sandy came through, where the primary trunks and branches are there, but it's the distal leaves and the arborization, if you will, that was blown away. And this is the pattern that we're seeing in our military population who have been exposed to repetitive blast injuries. And we have likewise worked out ways to quantify this change in the arborization, the distal spread of these white matter pathways, and now we're able to correlate them with cognitive consequences in the military population in particular. So let me give you an example of how this manifests itself. This was a patient of mine who was in an ATV accident. He spent three weeks in a coma. When he finally emerged from coma, he couldn't move the left side of his body, and he spent a year trying to recover not just cognitive function, but the use of his left side. And these are the kinds of pictures that we get, and if you know how to take care of this population, you also know that we have no idea what to tell this patient or his family. We have no idea what this person's gonna look like a year later. But when we did a high-definition fiber tracking scan on his brain, and we looked at his motor system, we found that we could quantify very specifically that the projection fibers for his, that control his arm had a certain degree of, of, uh, of fiber loss. 97% of the fibers that controlled his hand were gone, and the leg was much less affected. And now a year later, this guy walks without a limp, but he has a claw hand. And this is his understanding of his own problem. Told, hit the road without a helmet on. I was in a coma for three and a half weeks. When our patient was first admitted to the hospital, he was in a coma. And on the basis of the pictures we took of his brain at the time, it was virtually impossible to distinguish what parts of his brain would get, would get better and which were. Fibers in my brain that control your different limbs. Like there's fibers that control your hands, your arms, your legs, your feet, everything. The fibers that control my arm were 67% missing, and the fibers that control my hand are 97% missing. C could you imagine if every single patient had that degree of crystallarity about their own problem, right? We have to get to the point that we are handing our, ourselves, our physicians, and our patients clarity. They need to understand what is wrong with their brain. And if every single patient understood 
this clearly what was wrong with them, it would be a massive paradigm shift. And we've worked, we've been working with, uh, um, with uh, software engineers to develop apps that I can use the gyroscope function of my iPhone and sit with a patient in clinic and show them precisely where we're seeing the problem inside of their brain. And we're working on ways to do this with telemedicine. And then in the end, the most important piece of this is it's not just pretty pictures, where we're now being able to publish data that shows that when we identify problems below a certain threshold in a specific white matter pathway, that it correlates with cognitive function in these patients. And that is the next major step in all of this, is knowing how to transcend from just a pretty picture into understanding what the consequence is for the patient. And then I'll finish up because General Corelli told me yesterday that, that we needed to talk about this. And, uh, and when a man has that many stars on his shoulders, you just say, sir, yes, sir. So the last thing that I will, uh, I'll, I'll talk about is, is some of our biomarker work. Prostate cancer uh, had a massive, massive paradigm shift itself when it was discerned that you could check in the blood the prostate specific antigen, the PSA, and you can understand whether the treatment you're giving someone with prostate cancer is effective by simply checking a blood test, okay? We need a blood test for TBI. We need a blood test that tells us that someone has in fact had a TBI, and we also need a blood test that's gonna tell us whether what we're doing for that person is taking effect and getting much earlier feedback than waiting to test them six and 12 months later. So we started this process five years ago now, and in the early days, what we, what we started off by doing was just looking at, at patients with varying degrees of abnormalities on their CAT scans. We tested a very, very long list of biomarkers, and we had a couple of very strong hits, the strongest of which was something called GFAP. And what we found was that there was a certain threshold that this, this protein is released in response to injury, and the higher the injury, the higher the level of this protein is in blood, and there's a threshold below which you almost certainly have a normal CAT scan. And that's a big deal for our military population, but also a big deal in the civilian world. And I should point out that, that this work really got started over 20 years ago when Kevin Wang was synthesizing these antibodies when he worked for his pharmaceutical company. He had no idea what they were gonna be, what they were gonna be useful for. We were using them to do basic science work in animal models of brain injury. And then 20 years later, lo and behold, these are the antibodies that serve as the substrate for our capacity to develop a blood test for brain injury. And when you look at the diagnostic performance of this blood test, you develop these curves and you get this thing called the AUC. Well, this is the AUC of a blood test that is performed in every hospital in the Western world. If you present to an emergency room with chest pain, they're gonna check something called a troponin in your blood. And the diagnostic performance of troponin to detect myocardial ischemia, a heart attack, we have actually already surpassed the diagnostic performance of troponin for heart disease with this blood test looking at whether you have a positive or negative head CT. It's a game changer. And if you put this in a real world patient sample, use of this blood test would result in 30% fewer CAT scans being performed in the United States um, for patients who come in ha after having uh, had a hit to the head. And the last point of this is, all these companies that spent hundreds of millions of dollars on those 33 clinical trials that failed, they all walked away. They all said brain injury is too hard, it's too complicated, and it's a money loser, and they all walked away. And it's through track and through this public-private partnership that we're creating the pathway for these companies to come back into the space and get back in the game so that we're actually going to be able to deliver something that matters to patients. And so in summary, we have created a collaborative science environment that's, that is disrupting TBI research in a very positive way. We're finding industry partners returning to the field after large-scale retreats, and we're gonna convert big data into tools, interventions, and solutions for victims of traumatic brain injury. So thank you very much on behalf of all my collaborators. <laughs>